Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 153 of Gun Blog Variety Cast Radio, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you doing, Aaron? Well, one of my friends is visiting Poland, and in one of the most casually horrific asides I've ever seen, he signed off a message with, Anywise, off to Auschwitz. I don't want to make light of that at all, but that's just sort of how my week has been. I have been, I feel like I've been beaten up for the past week. And it started out really well because on Monday, I received a telephone call from Mr. Peter Brownell. And that name ought to be familiar to our listeners because Mr. Brownell is both the chief executive officer of Brownells Corporation, the Amazon of Guns, but also the newly sworn in president of the NRA. And he wanted to talk to me about ways that the NRA could be more inclusive and welcoming for LGBTQ individuals. And I thought this was fantastic. And we talked for a good 45 minutes and He asked me questions, and he listened to what I said, and it was a very productive exchange of information. I'm not allowed to go into what we discussed, because that's strategy, but I will tell you that Mr. Brownell is very interested in making positive changes and making it quickly. He said that he doesn't want it to become uh, his successor's problem. So this is something he wants to accomplish. And I thought this was wonderful. And I was flattered that he talked to me about it. And so I posted this on the Operation Blazing Sword Facebook page. And there were more than a few people who got, shall we say, butthurt that we were talking with the NRA. Their objection seems to be that the NRA supports Republicans and Republicans are anti-LGTBQ. Therefore, we shouldn't be talking with the NRA until they stop supporting people who are anti-LGTBQ. While I understand their position, I don't agree with it. And I was trying to convey the message that if you rebuff advances from people who are reaching out and trying to make changes because they aren't perfect yet, You aren't going to get anywhere. Change has to come from within, and it has to come slowly. Just the fact that the NRA is interested in making changes and becoming more inclusive is phenomenal. So I was trying to explain that, and I had some limited success. (laughs) You're not pure enough, Aaron. You must be purified. Yeah, I think there were some people who were there just, well... It's probably unfair to say that they were there just to be offended. Maybe it's true. I don't know. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is they want to let the perfect get in the way of the good. Yes, 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 that is exactly so. I have spent the last several days working on a mission statement explaining that, no, this is not a gross betrayal of everything we stand for because... While Operation Blazing Sword is about LGBTQ rights and it is about firearms training, that's not really the message. That's more the way the message is delivered. The actual message is reaching across the aisle in the spirit of acceptance and cooperation. And that's what's going on with the NRA. And so I'm having to explain that, no, we aren't becoming... uh, an arm of the NRA. We aren't being bought out by them. We're talking with them. And that doesn't make us bad. It doesn't make them bad. It means we're working towards a better tomorrow. At this point, I've just had to create a carefully crafted mission statement to explain in very polite terms what they are misunderstanding and why, because it would be unprofessional for me if I started off with, listen up, you primitive screwheads. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. I feel better now, though, so that's good. How are you doing, Sean? I am doing wonderfully, Aaron. Did you see the picture? Yes, I saw the picture you sent me of your pretty purple pistol. 
but I was under the impression that it was going to be some sort of fusion between urban camo and cryptic. Now I can definitely see the cryptic, but where is the urban part of the camo? There isn't any. I think we talked about this last week that that was the change in plan. Originally it was going to be an urban camo because I really didn't like cryptic. Because Cryptek typically is completely covering the object with weirdo scale things. Yeah, it looks like some sort of snakeskin pattern. At least I think so. It does. But when the whole thing's covered with a snakeskin pattern, it just doesn't look right to me. So I go in on a Monday, and a guy there named Matt had posted a picture the night before of a Cryptek job that he had done on an AR-15. Well, it's actually it was an AR-10 that was going to be a 6.5 Creedmoor build for Delphi Tactical. And what he had done is instead of making it cryptic the whole thing, he had put patches of cryptic and then had shaded colors into each other in a more traditional freehand sort of camouflage way. You know, back in the day when I was in the army and, and you wore woodland camo and it was all sort of curves and stuff, it wasn't totally cryptic and it wasn't totally a freehand camo job. It was really cool. And he was telling me, I'm having trouble finding urban camo that I like. And I said, well, you know what? The heck with the urban camo. If you can do that cryptic job on my pistol just in purple, black, and white, dude, that's what I want. You sure? Because I could totally do that. I'm like, yeah, and yeah, I'm sure. That's what I want. Do that. A couple of days ago, I get a phone call. Hey, Sean, it's done. Come get it. So if you want to see a picture of this gun, you have to go to my Instagram page, which is at SD Sorrentino, and take a look at it. Matt, who works there, took a picture of it in front of an American flag, and that's what they posted. And that is just a really gorgeous picture. I I love the composition and the quality of that picture. I don't know what he took it with, because I'm not a camera. He took it with a cell phone. He took it with a cell phone? That's amazing. (laughs) Isn't it? Wow. All I could think was, you know what? I would love to see this gun on a magazine cover or something. I'm like, this is just different. This is so completely different than anything else I've ever seen. It's exactly what I wanted, even though I couldn't describe what I wanted. This was it. I can't say enough about how great Carolina Ceramic Coatings did and how well they treated me. So if you were looking for actual Cerakote work on your firearms, and it doesn't have to be crazy purple, you know, it can be like a normal pattern. It can actually be just one color if you like. If you're looking for really, really good work, check out Carolina Ceramic Coatings. There'll be a link in the show notes. See, Sean, now I'm jealous. You have me wanting a really pretty gun. I only have two pistols. One is my carry Glock, which is kind of ugly because that's a Glock for you. It's functional, and I've had to carve finger grooves into it so my little hobbit hands can reach the trigger. And the other is my even smaller Colt Mustang 380 that I use when I go to church and things like that. Well, I suppose the Glock would do well with Cerakoting, but it's just, I've done such a butcher job on the grip. That would be like putting lipstick on a pig. It it would. I think I've seen that Glock. It's fugly. What we really need to do is one of two things. Either we need to get you a SIG P320 and get you a small grip module, and then you can just have the smaller version of mine in your own colors, not purple. Or the other option is we should get a hold of Boresight Solutions and buy you a Glock from them where they'll professionally reshape the thing to fit your Hobbit hands. Unfortunately, that's a little more expensive. Ah, well, I'll just put it on my Christmas list. Thanks to Lucky Gunner and Remington for their support of Gunblog Variety Cast Radio. From Golden Saber to Range Rounds, get a full lineup of quality Remington ammo that ships fast at luckygunner.com. Well, let's get on with the show. Beth has had enough of the madness. Yet another woman has been shot by her own gun from inside her purse. This kind of tragedy is 100% avoidable if you use your brain and follow the do's and don'ts of purse carry. So there's yet another story in the news about a woman who apparently was carrying a gun in her purse and she ends up shooting herself. I am so, so sick and tired of these stories. It makes gun owners look bad. It makes concealed carry purses or carrying in a purse or off body look terrible. And it also makes women look kind of inept at this. It's frustrating. This kind of thing should not happen. 
I love the fact as well that the title of one of these reports states, and I quote, woman shot by gun in purse at mall at millennia. Now, of course, anyone out there could argue that there were some misplaced modifiers there. But beyond that, the gun is just going around shooting people. I guess it just happened to be in her purse and it just happened to go off. Of course, my very first question is what in the world was in her purse? One of these little reports says a woman was shot in the leg outside the mall at Millennia Saturday night when a gun went off in her purse. Okay, guns don't just quote unquote go off. So apparently this gun was floating around in a bag with who knows what else. Keys, keychains, hairbands, lipstick, brushes, who knows? I have read this story or this kind of story, however, many, many times. In fact, I feel like over the last five years, I've read this same kind of thing at least once or twice every year. And I'm probably missing some of them as well. Look, if you are going to carry off body, there are certain things that you absolutely positively must follow. First and foremost, the most important safety, which is your brain. Turn it on keep it on. And do not let that bag or that firearm get out of your sight or your control. This means that if you make the decision that you want to carry your gun in your purse, then you cannot set your purse down in the shopping cart and walk across the aisle to buy your box of Cracklin' Oat Bran. It also means that you cannot set your purse down in the seat at the local restaurant and not pay attention to it where somebody could easily pick it up because you're looking the other way. This means that that purse must be basically glued to you. It is stuck on you and with you all the time. That is the first rule. And it's extremely important if you are a mother or a grandmother or you are going to be around children. If you let that bag out of your sight, you have basically given them an invitation to go into your belongings and potentially find a firearm. The second thing that I just don't understand is you can't put your gun in your purse as if you would be putting a wallet or a brush in your purse. I don't get it, people. That firearm can be a lethal weapon. It needs to have its own designated pocket its own designated holster, and it needs to follow all the same safety rules that you would follow with any other kind of holster. So you're looking to make sure that it's actually going to be functional, and it's going to be accessible, and it's going to be sturdy and durable, and it's going to be safe, which means that that trigger and trigger guard must be completely covered. So there are plenty of options out there. When it comes to concealed carry bags, you can get one like we've discussed before from Yukoala. These are very handy and can work like a backpack or it can actually buckle around your waist and around your thigh. So it kind of works like an on-body, off-body carry. You can also go to guntotenmamas.com and look at their huge selection of concealed carry bags that are designed specifically to be safe carriers of guns of many different styles and shapes. The other option, of course, would be to get something like the Pack and Neat by Kristen. This insert is a special little organizing tote that has a separate pocket just for your firearm. And this little organizing tote can actually go from purse to purse to purse or bag to bag to bag, or it can even be taken out of the bag very easily and slipped into the console of your vehicle while driving. So there are options out there that are safe and that are effective and that will keep these things from happening. I know that I sound like I'm just on some big pedestal and I've probably lost my mind, but seriously, folks, this kind of negligent shooting is absolutely 100% avoidable. All you have to do is make sure that you are using your brain, that the bag is under your control at all times, and that the firearm is safely holstered with nothing else in there that could somehow get tangled or caught up in that trigger or trigger guard and press the trigger. Please don't let these kinds of things happen again. I don't want to see this in the news. Please make sure you are informed and that you are informing other people around you. And as always, stay safe 
and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the donate or subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. A little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. Assault suspect found dead in basement of Winston-Salem home. Okay? Dateline Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Winston-Salem police officers are conducting a death investigation after a suspect's body was found in a home basement. Police say the situation started on Saturday around 7 p.m. after they responded to 320 Grand Street Stop by and say hi. for reports of an assault on a female. Upon arrival, officers identified the suspect as a 24-year-old white male who had active warrants for his arrest, a press release said. Family identified the man to WXII 12 News as suspect. According to police, suspect fled the area on foot and officers pursued him, but eventually lost sight of him. A perimeter was established and a canine track was conducted with negative results. A short time later, a citizen alerted officers that she heard noises in her basement. Officers walked to the residence and observed signs of a break-in through a basement window. Officers then entered the residence and located suspect, deceased, on the basement floor from a wound apparently sustained from breaking into the home. The homeowner said they spoke with a 21-year veteran officer with the Winston-Salem Police Department who reportedly told them it was the bloodiest mess they've ever seen. Girlfriend, suspect's girlfriend, says suspect was scared. He was a young guy that didn't want to go to jail, said girlfriend. He'd do anything for anybody. He took care of people he cared about and made sure they were fine. The North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation was notified of the incident, but did not respond after determining that it was not an in-custody death. All right, so we have someone who has active warrants for his arrest, who was running from the police because he assaulted a female. He breaks into a home to escape the police. But, you know, once he's there, who knows what he's going to do? And he actually kills himself by, it sounds like he severed a major blood vessel on the broken glass while climbing in. That's kind of what it sounds like to me. But, all right, so his girlfriend says that he was a young guy who'd do anything for anybody, and he really worked hard for the people he cared about, so... So clearly, this is his first offense, right? I mean, he had, doesn't have a record. He hasn't done anything else wrong. Clearly. Let's take a look at his work history. Suspect. Three counts larceny, misdemeanor, class one. Unauthorized use of a motor conveyance, misdemeanor, class one. Two counts breaking and entering vehicles, felon, class I. Assault by strangulation, felon, class H. Felony breaking and entering, felon, class H. And larceny after breaking and entering, felon, class H. Yeah, I would really be worried for this woman's safety if he hadn't killed himself inside the house. All right, so who would date this man? Two counts, DWI level 1, misdemeanor, non-class code. DWI level 5, misdemeanor, non-class code. Two counts, drug paraphernalia, use possess, misdemeanor, class 3. Two counts, larceny, misdemeanor, class 1. Maintain any place controlled substance, misdemeanor, class 1. And two counts of child abuse. Misdemeanor, class A1. Okay, why is child abuse a misdemeanor? Apparently, the particular version that she was arrested for wasn't bad enough to warrant felony. Oh, okay. So she's only slightly scum. Only slightly. In movies and TV, we always see hackers sitting in the dark behind their computers, tapping their way to a break-in. But as the greatest hacker of all, Kevin Mitnick will tell you, the real way in is called social engineering. Just this week, a guy snuck into the Conor McGregor Floyd Mayweather press conference with badges he cloned from images on Facebook. Baron tells us how it's done in... Tech Tips. Tech Tech Tips. Tech tips. Tips. You are damaging my calm. Tech Tips with the Baron. Hey kids, I'm back this week, and this time I'm not going to talk as much about a tech tip as I'm going to talk about more of a social engineering trick. On Sunday, Sean sent me a link to a video where a guy snuck backstage for a press conference with the McGregor versus Mayweather fight. 
if you don't follow UFC, don't worry about it. Basically, what you need to know is that we are talking about a very high-profile press conference, and someone who was not a part of the press corps, not a part of anything, actually snuck in and basically was standing right next to McGregor and the groups. So here's what happened. One of the team members, you know, for the staff, posted a picture of the press passes and the special passes that would allow you into different places. Promptly, our wonderful individual here took that picture, shoved it into Photoshop, spent a bunch of time in Photoshop, and basically made himself his own printed badge that looked exactly like the real deal. The reason this is significant is because badges in the real world rarely get inspected. The only time they ever get inspected is if there's an RFID reader or a QR code that gets scanned. Other than that, there's not going to be much inspection. And even then, when it comes to a QR code or even a scanning with RFID, if somebody has a badge that's legitimate and can properly copy it, it's not going to matter. Because the thing is, is no one's going to take the record of what came up on the scanner and reconcile whether or not that's actually the individual. The problem is the amount of effort and time it takes to get through all of that is far higher than the minor inconvenience of the possibility of somebody getting that backstage. Now, when I say this, what you need to understand is they can still catch your ass backstage and you're in deep shit if you get caught. However, there are a few very key things that you can do to not get caught. The first and foremost of these rules is to strictly adhere to what I refer to as the king shit rule. And that is, if you walk around, act, and move like you are the king shit, i.e. you are acting with purpose, you are not looking suspicious, you are acting as if you know exactly where you're going and what's going on. You are not looking around, you're not being a busybody, you're not taking selfies, you're not doing all those things you shouldn't be doing, which this guy really should have probably gotten busted because he was taking videos and selfies and all the rest of it. But as long as you are looking like you're supposed to be there, all of a sudden you blend in. You do not stand out. You do not look suspicious. It's the key. You do not stand out. So for example, you know, the people who do extreme body modifications, hey, if you want to do that, that's your your stick, not judging. However, if you want to sneak in through the side door of a facility and not get caught, well, if you have implants under your skin of your skull that make it look like you have devil horns, you're going to stand out. And unless somebody knows that you're supposed to be there, you're probably going to get caught. But this comes around to badges. Often you always hear people say, wear your badge where it's visible, yada, yada, yada. This is generally a good thing while you are inside of a facility. The second you're leaving a facility, i.e. you're moving into public, put your badge out of sight. Don't leave it around your neck. Don't leave it where it's visible. People can take pictures of it. They can take the pictures and then make their own fake badge. Again, if we have badge readers and, you know, the badges are gated access, that's fine. It works decently well. However, if you're not aware, there's this common practice known as piggybacking, i.e. somebody sees you coming up to the door, notices that you have a badge that looks legitimate, and they let you right straight through the door. A lot of paces have policies to help prevent this, but the fact remains is once you get past that badge access door, I now have a badge and I look exactly like I'm supposed to be there. So don't have your badges out where they're available and easily to be seen and taken pictures of because really that's a core credential. You're using that as authentication that you're supposed to be there. So if you want an additional example of this, look at AT AT&T, Comcast, any major ISP that's doing service provider work. I can copy one of those badges, throw it around my neck, dress as if I'm a tech, walk up to the desk of a building and say, hey, there's been a report of a problem in your IT closet. I need to take a look. Nine times out of 10, someone will let me into that IT closet. Here's the funny part. I don't even have to be the ISP for the company in question. They will just assume that I am legitimate based on the fact that I show up dressed as I should be and everything else. So this comes into the whole looking like you're competent, know what you're doing. It's again, the king shit rule. It works wonders. And if you're wondering how well it works, I was all of about 15 and walked through the emergency room doors of an emergency room and went room to room looking for somebody The thing is, is not a single person stopped me or asked or anything, and I was able to immediately go to the person I was looking for and without a single problem. And yes, I passed nurses and doctors. No one batted an eye because I wasn't acting like an ass and I was moving with purpose. So again, 
king shit rule. If you want to exploit it, act like king shit. Walk around, act with purpose, move with purpose. Do not do things like walk as if you're trying to try every door. Just generally walk as if you know where you're going. Be observant. Don't sit there and call attention to yourself, though. If you're trying to stop this, things to do when someone claims to be a tech and is coming up, call the company. If I show up and say that I'm from AT&T and you haven't scheduled an appointment, you turn around and call AT&T and ask them to verify I am who I say I am. If you see somebody coming up to a door that, you know, needs to badge, ask them to scan their badge. Now, badge readers are interesting because for the most part, they will always beep. Some, some of them are now actually starting to beep differently depending on success or failure. But the big clue is, is most of them have a light and they will blink red if the scan fails and they're denied access. They will blink green if they are given access. Pay attention to how it scans. Don't just listen for the beep. So that is basically a quick, solid intro 101 course to how to get into places that you're not supposed to be. Now, if you do this and you get caught, I had nothing to do with it. I am not telling you to do this. Don't do this. Just take it as a lesson of things to look out for and realize that just because somebody looks like they know exactly what they're doing doesn't necessarily mean that they're supposed to be there. And I have had numerous instances where I am mistaken for staff at a function because I am walking from point A to B with purpose and it's just naturally the way I carry myself. So with that, folks, remember, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying and don't get caught. If you get caught, not my fault. And with that, have a great week. Baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org. Miguel is on assignment and will return next week. Hey gang, this is Masad Ayub from the Pro Arms Podcast. I'm here to remind you that our podcast is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. And I'm going to suggest you do what we do and check out the other podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. Gunblog Variety Cast Radio is proud to welcome special guest Charles Van Vec. Charles was a member of the St. James Church in Cape Town, South Africa when it was attacked by terrorists. In this third part of a three-part interview series, Charles explains the Christian justification for self-defense. Charles Van Vec is a Christian missionary, author, and activist in Africa. His belief in his Christian duty to protect the innocent, vulnerable, and oppressed led him to single-handedly return fire in the midst of a terrorist attack, saving many lives. Welcome back to the show, Charles. Sean, wonderful to be here with you. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to chat to you and your listeners today. Charles, over and over we hear people citing the Bible against guns and against self-defense. You're not only a Christian, but you're a missionary. How do you answer these people? Very good question, Sean. It's, uh, there's a lot of people out there who believe that Christians should be pacifists. A friend of mine took a group of film people into Sudan during the war there. It was between the Christians in the south and the Muslims in the north. And one day they were filming a pastor. And they said to the pastor, what are your needs? This is on film. What are your needs? And he said, what we need is military hardware. And my friend said to the pastor, you can't say that on camera to Americans. And he said, why not? My missionary friend explained to the pastor, he said, well, there are people in America who are pacifists. And the pastor said, what on earth is a pacifist? So he said, no, they're people who love the Lord, they love Jesus, but they believe that they're never allowed to use any kind of weapon to protect their family. The pastor said, well, then they're not Christian. So, you know, it's uh, really interesting that an African pastor in, in Central Africa can fully believe in the need for military hardware to protect their families from the Muslim North, and yet they, you know, in the West we find pacifists who will not raise a finger for their own family and protect them. But then we've got to look at scripture. What does scripture teach on these issues? And we can go back right down to uh, all the way through to Exodus, where we see um, in Exodus 22 verse 2, if a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. And so it's dealing with a thief is uh, busy breaking in. Um, you can go look at the scriptures more carefully. It's dark. Um, you can't see if the man's carrying a knife. Or, you know, is he armed with a gun? Um, and so in a life-threatening situation, if you protect yourself with lethal force, uh, scripture is saying that um, there's no guilt 
for doing that. The, the bloodshed is not, uh, it's not murder that took place there. We can go further into Proverbs 25, verse 26, like a muddied spring or a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. We as Christians must not give way to the wicked. We've got to stand up for righteousness and truth. And so, uh, you know, are we going to act like the muddied spring or like a polluted well, which is absolutely useless, can't be used for anything? Later on, we see in the Bible that Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples. And uh, Luke 22, verse 36, and he says to them, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. So Jesus is telling his his disciples to buy the finest military weapon of the time, which was a sword. And why did he do that? Well, because then they were going to possibly need to defend themselves in the future. We also see in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. And obviously, provision is much more than just clothing and food. We need to provide for the safety of our families too. And so uh, the scriptures are are very clear about this. Now, you'll find people often say things like, when Peter took uh, his sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus, who worked for the high priest, uh, we find that uh, Jesus told him to get rid of the sword. But if we read the scripture very clearly, we'll see that Jesus told him to put the sword in its place. He was using it at the wrong time. And further than that, uh, he was trying to stop um, God's way of salvation for us, which was Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying for our sins. Furthermore, if Jesus wanted to uh, stop the attack from taking place or, or if he needed help in any way which so, whatsoever, He said he could call legions of angels down from heaven and they would come and protect him and help him. And so we've got to be very careful with the way we read scripture. We've got to see it in the context and understand it to see that we as Christians mustn't be a bunch of pacifists giving way to the wicked and let them just run uh, all over us. We're not called to be doormats for Jesus. We need to stand up for what's right and true. And if our family were found in a life-threatening situation, then we need to be able to protect them with lethal force. That doesn't mean you just shoot every Tom, Dick, and Harry because he's stolen an apple from you or just because you feel that uh, somebody's hurt your feelings. If somebody's hurt your feelings, suck it up. Get with it. But if somebody threatens your life, the scripture does not say, if somebody shoots your son, let him shoot your daughter too. If somebody rapes your daughter, let him rape your wife too. It doesn't say anything like that. We have to stand up for righteousness and truth. It's been exciting seeing in Africa in my mission work, teaching young boys this, teenagers, to stand up for the protection of women. In their society, both in Zimbabwe and South Africa, it is very normal for men to get drunk and to beat women senseless. Um, And I'm in the most horrific way, seeing them being injured and hurt and, and black eyes and sometimes cut with knives and things like that. Well, these young men are putting a stop to that in their society now. And it's just exciting to see that when there's somebody drunk and he's beating a woman, the young men that we are training on these scriptures, understanding that, are protecting these women. Praise the Lord for these young guys, that they're getting into situations with gangsters uh, who are trying to injure girls and hurt women, that they're standing up. They don't even have weapons, these young men. They might have a big stick and that's about it. So do you think that there's a difference between people who live in a society where violence is really obvious and really widespread and people who live in the relatively peaceful West? I think so. I think a lot of times, uh, we should avoid this, but I think a lot of times our theology is based on our circumstances that we live in. And I'll remember having a conversation with one of our leaders in the church in South Africa after the St. James Massacre where uh, somebody was criticizing me for for shooting back uh, publicly in the newspapers. And I remember this leader saying to me, yes, but you must understand that he's lived virtually all his life in the UK, in Britain. And my comment was, well, we shouldn't allow our living circumstances to dictate our theology. Our theology should dictate how we live in the world. And so it was an interesting chat. But yes, I think you're 100% correct, Sean, that that is the way it works, but it shouldn't. So tell me a little bit more about what it's like to live in a country and in a region where violence is terribly widespread compared to here. It's difficult. Just to give you a bit of an idea of the way we live, we have big high walls around our house. We have security gates over all our doors. We have big bars, metal bars over all our windows. And then it's bolted into our brick walls. That's the way we live. 
in the time that I've been living in my house, which is about uh, 15, 16 years right now, we've had my sister-in-law attacked outside our front door. Uh, her handbag was stolen. They didn't physically beat her up, but they, they stole her handbag and they broke it off her, her shoulder, which uh, just injured her slightly. Uh, I've had a neighbor about 100 yards up the road who was murdered and another neighbor right next door who was stabbed inside his home. They caught the attacker inside my garden and the police sorted him out there, as in violently sorted the attacker out with my kids standing watching this from the lounge window, which devastated them psychologically for a long time afterwards. We've had cars stolen on both sides of our home. This is the way we live our lives. I've been through a terrorist attack. I've been through an attempt at carjacking. The people that I live with in these, these squatter camps and that who I work with in these different areas, they see worse things than us. But sometimes, and, and unfortunately, this is what happens when the chaos carries on like this. You start having vigilante groups and people start taking the law into their own hands. And then those of us who are trying to live righteous lives, we actually sympathize with them. When your mother is being raped for the second time, the son's going to go and get himself an illegal weapon, what would be classified illegal in South Africa. He's probably going to steal it. And then he's going to go sort out the murder himself because, you know, we had a kid that was murdered for a cigarette in the area I work in. The kid's still walking around in the area. Nothing wrong. He hasn't been charged. He hasn't gone to jail. Nothing's happened. And people just don't care. We had an attack on one of the shops, or the only shop in, in this uh, squatter camp area that I work with in the informal settlement. And three men came in. Uh, one was a driver of a vehicle, and they came and held up the shop, shop with their guns. And the people say that the police were there just to protect the bad guys. And they firmly believe that. They said, you never see police here except for when an attack is imminent. And uh, so they're saying the police are being paid off, which, you know, goodness knows if that's true or not, but that's what the people are accusing them of. These people go in, they take over the shop, the whole community gets so upset that they attack these three attackers. An unarmed community attacks men with guns. Two of the men run away so fast that they couldn't be caught. They catch the one man. They're going to sort him out themselves. The police come and take the man away. But before the police get there, an elderly man comes up with his walking stick. An old black man walking up with his walking stick. He takes his stick and he hits one shot to this armed thug that was caught. The next thing, the whole community climbs into this man. The police had to come save him from the community. But why do you think this happened? It's because they're just so sick and tired of all this thuggery that's going on. They're sick and tired of it. And, and that's what starts happening in a society where law and order breaks down, there's no justice, and so the people start meeting out their own justice. So is it easier for us here in a peaceful country to be pacifist since there's no real consequence for being a pacifist? I believe so. You know, you can sit on your theological high horse and criticize people in, in tough areas. But what we really need to do is get back to Scripture and study what God's Word teaches on these issues. Am I allowed to take life? Under what circumstances are, am I allowed to take life? How do I uh, protect my family? If God expects me to not be the muddied spring or the polluted well, what does it look like? Am I the minister of justice? No, I'm not. The civil government is the minister of justice in a society. I'm the minister of grace. But what does grace look like when somebody's trying to rape your wife or your daughter? Grace looks like taking a bullet and protecting them and uh, shooting the bad guy to protect life. And so very difficult issues to discuss. There's no easy way of dealing with things, but uh, we really need to get into Scripture and see how we can practically apply it in, in every area of our lives, Sean. All right, Charles. It was good to talk with you. See you again soon. Sean, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been great chatting to you. You can find out more about Charles at missionaryinafrica.com. You can also buy his book, Shooting Back, at Amazon. There's a link in the show notes. This was the third part of Charles' three-part interview. If you missed the first two parts of the interview, make sure to download episodes 151 and 152. What is your calling? Do you know? And are you really being honest with yourself about what your true calling might be? This week, Tiffany salutes those who answer the call of law enforcement, but she also has a warning for those who only do so half-heartedly. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Till you climb inside of his skin, walk around in it. Hey folks, Tiffany here. So... There's been a lot in the news lately about controversial police shootings, which you guys know I despise. But 
Not going to delve into the yays or nays of those shootings. There's enough of that already out on the interwebs. But instead, I want to kind of have a little fireside chat with all of my police officer friends. Not as anybody who has any standing to tell you what to do, obviously, because I don't. But just as your average, everyday, ordinary constituent, somebody out there who is looking up to the police and looking forward to having a pleasant experience with them. But first, let's kind of back up. Okay, so I'm an attorney. For a long time, I swore I didn't want to be an attorney. I knew myself and my strengths and weaknesses, and I did not think the law was for me. Well, it turns out I actually love the practice of law. I love the theory of law, love reading about it, learning about it, talking about it, thinking about it. What I don't like is clients. (laughs) I am the most introverted person on earth. I have zero tolerance for shenanigans. So dealing with clients all day would cause me to leap headfirst off the nearest building as soon as humanly possible. So, So I know that that part of the job is not for me. And once I figured that out about myself, I was able to tweak my career path So I could do what I enjoy, have a sense of purpose, make a little money, and keep my sanity, and most importantly, not hurt anybody. That last part is really important, in my opinion. Not hurt anybody, do no harm, as they say in the medical field. Because the truth is, if I had kept working in a big law firm in a traditional litigation practice, my work would have suffered. My clients would have suffered because I hadn't made prudent career choices, and that would not have been fair to them. But what does hurting people look like? In in my field, hurting people means the clients lose their cases, which usually means loss of money or privileges or access or property. And that sucks, but in other fields, the consequences are even more pronounced. Take the medical field, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the, the do no harm mantra. In that field, doing harm means someone suffers unnecessary pain, prolonged illness, loss of an organ or limb, or in the worst cases, loss of life. When that happens, because a physician has made a mistake, the physician has to be held accountable. She can't say, well, my job is stressful or difficult, and physicians can't say, well, I hadn't gotten a lot of sleep the night before, or I've done three surgeries in a row. And they can't say, well, my patient was a very difficult patient and didn't follow my instructions, or my patient should have done what I said, and they wouldn't have lost their limb or their organ. No. (laughs) That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. If a patient dies because of a doctor's preventable mistake, that doctor is on the chopping block. It doesn't mean the doctor's a bad person. It doesn't even mean necessarily that the doctor's a bad doctor. It just means that a mistake was made and it requires accountability. What if we weren't talking about lawyers or doctors, but police officers? Remember how I said I tweaked my career in law to make it fit my strengths and my personal tolerance levels? Yeah, I basically left the big firm world and became a consultant. So now I do legal research and writing by contract. I only work in a limited capacity at arm's length with other lawyers and I never deal with the clients and the office politics and the, you know, copy room and mail room and all of that other crap that I know I'm just not cut out to handle long term. (laughs) It's just not me. I couldn't do it. Well, in the same vein, I also know I'm not cut out to handle police work. I would be on edge all the time. I might be nervous, overly suspicious or jumpy. I might even be terrified. And again, I don't think that makes me a bad person, but I know I'm not the type to work out six times a day or become an expert martial artist or delve into the weeds of human social sciences all of which I think would be indispensable to a good police officer. Now, I could lie to myself and try to be a cop because it's a noble, respectable profession and a steady paycheck, just like I could have kept my position on the 26th floor in my corner office with all that swank at the big shot law firm. I might have done fine and might have had some good days, but I know I never would have really been at the top of my game, not in that context. And eventually it would come back to bite. Eventually... I would hurt somebody. But again, as I said, luckily for me, dropping the ball in my field would have only cost people money. In the field of law enforcement, dropping the ball means somebody gets killed. And not just killed, but killed at the hands of the government, the man, big brother, imposing a death sentence without even a drop of due process. 
And there again, you shouldn't be able to say, oh, well, I was having a bad day or I didn't get a lot of sleep or the suspect was being difficult and didn't follow my instructions. Doctors don't get to blame patients. Lawyers don't get to blame clients. Waiters don't get to blame dining customers for mistakes in the meal order. Even if the dining customer was indecisive and, you know, mumbled a lot or none of that matters. It's the waiter's job to get the order right. And I hope police will resist the temptation to blame citizens for police encounters that go awry. Now, don't get me wrong. Quite often, citizens do some ill-advised things (laughs) when they encounter police. Citizens are very very often and very much in the wrong, just like patients, clients, and customers at Applebee's. And of course, I realize the analogy breaks down when you compare a restaurant patron's silly tantrum to a criminal suspect's dangerous desperation to evade police capture. I get that it's not a direct parallel, and I'm not saying that it is. All I'm saying to my beloved police buddies out there is please Take enough pride in your chosen profession to seek out whatever expertise you need to minimize the chances of an encounter veering that far off the rails in the first place. Greg Elifritz of Active Response Training and Craig Douglas of ShivWorks have both written about this topic in the past and more recently in the wake of the Philando Castile shooting. So has Chuck Haggart of Agile Training and Consulting. I think it's plain sad that police officers get so little training and support. Hell, I think I get more training in, shall we say, people management (laughs) in any given year than the average police officer does in the same amount of time. And turning back to my own profession, if all I had was a law degree and no further training and no further passion, that wouldn't give me the right to sit in my corner office and look clients in the eye and say, well, you're just going to have to tolerate my mediocrity because this job isn't quite the right fit for me and the law firm doesn't train me much or I had a bad day or I think you're an annoying client. (laughs) I couldn't say that. And the surgeon couldn't tell his patient, well, I chopped off the wrong leg. But honestly, I really wanted to be an ophthalmologist anyway. Can't say this job is so stressful that you can't expect me to do well at it all the time. Hell yes, I can expect you to do well all the time. Or, or I can expect you to take responsibility when you do drop the ball. If the job is too stressful for you, then either take the initiative to beef up your stress tolerance or consider doing another job. Either one of those options is great. Not everybody can be a cop, but don't straddle the fence. Not with a job like this. There's too much at stake. Don't knowingly sign up for a stressful job and then blame the stress when you don't excel at it. Or like Mike Lowry says, if you're going to sing the song, you got to learn the words. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when we come for you? The next step, the next step, next step, next step, next Hey, dude, you gotta learn the words. We usually only do the chorus. I know most beat cops don't make a lot of money, but they do get benefits. They get a heightened benefit of the doubt from courts and from juries. They get the benefit of qualified immunity from civil lawsuits. They get the benefit of being held in high esteem and respected for their service to this country. At least among reasonable observers, they're afforded that level of respect. I'm not talking about the crazies. But you can't walk into such a profession and then ask the community to tolerate mediocrity because it's so difficult. If your agency doesn't train you, please go out and seek the training on your own. Join groups of people with more experience and broader perspectives, and listen and evaluate and grow. Sign up for classes with people like Greg or Craig or Chuck, and force yourself to be a better officer for your own sake and for the sake of those you have sworn to protect and serve. If you're jumpy or nervous or scared, that's okay to a certain extent. I mean, you wouldn't be human if you had no fear at all, ever. But if that fear is insurmountable or debilitating, or if it overrides your thinking self or takes the proverbial wheel away from reason every time the shit hits the fan, then maybe it's time to tweak your career choices kind of like I had to do. I'm not and I never will be a police officer. So again, I don't mean to lecture anybody or veer outside of my lane. This is coming from the perspective of the client, the patient, the customer. The everyday citizen on the street who respects you, appreciates you, wants the best for you, and who fully expects to be safer and generally better off as a result of your honorable, admirable service. Even in my lay capacity, I know that police work is a calling, not a job. 
if it's not flowing through your veins every day, then you know what? You very well may be the next Officer Yanez or Officer Noor. So I commend and salute all the law enforcement personnel out there. I have the utmost respect for you. And I'm the first to admit that I just don't have the metal to do what you do and face what you face every day. I don't. And that's why I'm not a police officer. That's why no government will ever inflict death upon any citizen by my hand or with my gun. Ever. Not going to happen. If you've chosen to allow the government to act through you, if you've chosen to allow the government to use you as a conduit for the imposition of force, please make sure your hands are more than capable of doing so professionally, minimally, and effectively. And one more thing. If you're a member of the community who takes issue with your local policing, instead of hitting the streets in protest, consider scheduling a meeting with your local sheriff or police chief or precinct commander for a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Ask what you can do to help. Ask how you and your neighbors can help the agency increase its training budget or strengthen contacts in the neighborhood or get to know the local residents. I bet that would be more constructive than just whining on Facebook or letting your anger fester internally until it boils over. With that, I'll say to all my law enforcement friends and all the people they'll meet today and in the future, Stay safe, train hard, and keep it centered and even. You can follow Tiffany at frontsitepress.com. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron Paulette. Come on, every pony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Aaron Paulette! Last week, I promised that I would talk about PTSD and ways to break the cycle of flashbacks. However, I'm afraid that I have to postpone that segment for a week because I need to talk about emotional priming first. Put simply, witnessing trauma is itself traumatic to the viewer. This is because humans have structures in the brain called mirror neurons, which fire when performing an act, but also when seeing an act. This is why you have the urge to yawn when you see another person yawn, why you often vomit when you see or hear or smell another person vomit, and why you wince in pain when you see another person get hurt. Mirror neurons are essential to our development during childhood because they are how we learn. Monkey see, monkey do isn't just a childhood taunt, it's literally how we and other primates learn. It follows, then, that if we witness something horrible that happens to another person, our mirror neurons simulate that sense of horror, that pain, that shock within us. And while the sensation isn't as vivid, it's still real, and therefore it's entirely possible to develop post-traumatic stress disorder from watching tragedy happen to another person. In other words, PTSD can be considered an environmental or occupational hazard as much as a psychological one, especially if you work as a first responder. Put another way, you are more at risk for developing PTSD if you've already been exposed to extreme stress one or more times, and this vulnerability can last the rest of your life. This is what is known as being emotionally primed for PTSD. Think of your mind like a plate. Each traumatic event you witness is a crack within that plate. Some cracks are minor, but get enough of them and the plate will fall apart. Get a single big crack and the plate will fall apart. Unlike bones, which can heal over time and become stronger, the mind retains the memory of the horrors it sees and this can make it weaker, more prone to injury. This explains why so many first responders take up unhealthy habits and their desire to forget what they've seen. They are trying to erase those memories to heal the cracks in the plate of their psyche. So if you have witnessed anything truly horrific or traumatic, I urge you to seek counseling from a professional. Not because you're crazy, not because you are broken. Think of it as preventive maintenance. Just as you see the doctor every six months for a physical to keep on top of how your body is doing and to get ahead of potential issues, so too should you see a therapist if you have a history with trauma, especially chronic trauma. A professional will be able to detect patterns of unhealthy behavior and poor coping mechanisms and hopefully will help deprime you so that you don't suffer PTSD. Shannon Watts does an interview about the origins of Mom's Demand Action, at least how she claims it happened. Let's see what's truth and what's fiction inside Shannon Watts' mind in This, this Week, week in, in Anti-Gun anti Nuttery. Nuttery. 
So while looking for pictures of members of the Gunblog Variety cast on Shannon Watts' Twitter feed, I saw she did an interview for the Hellbent podcast. This podcast is a left-wing feminist show, and they decided Shannon is just the lady for them to look up to. They start the interview by reading the Moms Demand Action website. Shannon Watts is the founder of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. The group comprises American mothers fighting for public safety measures that respect the Second Amendment and protect people from gun violence. The respect the Second Amendment line is one we hear a lot of from anti-gunners these days. How does Moms Demand Action, a wholly owned subsidiary of Michael Bloomberg Incorporated, respect the Second Amendment? They don't. Every action they take directly attacks people owning guns, people using guns, and people carrying guns. So they respect the Second Amendment, but they are militantly against the right of the people to keep and bear arms. How does that work exactly? And protect people from gun violence? How? I guess this is more of a speculative, as the accomplishments for Michael Bloomberg's entire umbrella are really thin. Ones that can be directly attributed to mom's demand are almost zero. That being said, I guess since they're directly hostile to guns and gun owners in any way they can, the idea is if they eliminated guns, and us, they might have a world free from gun violence. You know, like how the Dark Ages had zero gun violence. Remember, gun violence is not the same as violence. Moms Demand Action has established a chapter in every state in the country and is a part of Every Town for Gun Safety, the largest gun violence prevention organization in the country with more than 3 million supporters. Now, part of this is correct. Every Town for Gun Safety, a wholly owned subsidiary of Michael Bloomberg Incorporated, is the largest gun control group in America. They lie and say gun violence prevention because, like the lie, we support the Second Amendment, telling the truth about being anti-gun is not going to win them any friends in their already dwindling pool. But really, it's Michael Bloomberg is the largest threat to the Second Amendment in America, and Shannon Watts just happens to work for him. But Shannon is a PR flack for a rich white male probably doesn't sound as good to the audience of a feminist podcast. They do have a chapter in every state. Good for them. Though I will add that many of these state chapters are joint chapters with every town, as the two groups are really one and the same. I gotta stop them at the 3 million supporters line. How do they arrive at that number? Because they count every single like on Facebook and every single follow on Twitter. It almost certainly includes A.A. Ron Pellet, which is the name that Sean gave them to get one of their t-shirts at the Atlanta rally. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! If you search their website, you will not find a single pay your membership and join our club link anywhere. Unlike the NRA, they don't actually need your money. It must be nice to have your anti-civil rights group bankrolled by a billionaire. Either way, I said that to loop back around to the supporters of Moms Demand Action. They have no members. They have employees, volunteers, and supporters. What is a supporter? I have no idea. But one thing is for sure, supporters are not the same as members. Prior to founding Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, Shannon was a stay-at-home mom in a suburb of Indianapolis, Indiana, after a 15-year career as a communications executive. Now here's the big lie. Shannon Watts was, and still is, a high-paid communications executive. Shannon Watts is also a mom. Before coming directly into the employ of Michael Bloomberg, Watts did maintain a home office for her corporate PR work. This is not the same as being a stay-at-home mom. Even NPR had to issue a correction when they parroted this false narrative. She began her activist career after the tragedy at Sandy Hook in 2012 with a Facebook group, and Mom Demands, Mom's Demand Action grew from there. Okay, this is a little more observational than hard facts. So first up, Shannon Watts was and is a staunch Democrat and has supported Democrat causes back before Mom's Demand was a thing. Shannon Watts is also a high-paid communications executive and has worked for large corporations. Further, Moms Demand Action was only a separate entity from Michael Bloomberg's Every Town for a very short period of time. Much of her alleged backstory has been proven false. So when I see something that doesn't seem likely, told to me by a proven liar, my gut tells me there's a more likely story. Let's play a game called, Which is More Likely? Is it more likely that Shannon just happened to start an organization in her kitchen and it just took off? Or... Is it more likely that Michael Bloomberg, wanting to recruit women to his cause and knowing that his name is toxic, hired a well-known PR flack ahead of time, had her lay all the PR groundwork, and waited for a mass shooting to gain media attention for their launch? Coincidentally, all around the exact same time he rebrands his failing Mayors Against Illegal Guns for the less descriptive Every Town for Gun Safety. Watts gets retained, and they simply wait for a big news event to capitalize on. 
Which sounds more likely to you? So after the long intro, Shannon finally speaks. So, you know, I was at home. Um, I have five kids, so folding laundry can be a full-time job. And that's uh-huh. what I was doing the day that the news came in over the television about Sandy Hook. So this is a really telling lie. When somebody says stay-at-home mom, that's generally noted as a career choice. Until very recently, I considered myself a stay-at-home dad. I scaled my hours back to part-time and spent the days I wasn't in the lab looking after my daughter. I also did homemaker things like cooking and cleaning and laundry, etc. in this time. I took a massive pay cut as I was doing much less work for my employer. Meanwhile, Watts was making big money working for massive corporations like Monsanto. She wasn't getting paid that much to do laundry full-time. But this is the image she's creating, even years after her background was made public. I wasn't an organizer. I've learned over the last five years almost. And it it really takes a lot of thought and effort and a lot of very committed people. Yes. I'm a full-time volunteer. Our, our entire organization is made up almost all of volunteers. I'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public relations and corporate communication and what skills might be common for the big players of both of these worlds. That being said, if Watts indeed had no background in organizing, Michael Bloomberg had people who could help her. As for her being unpaid, she certainly doesn't draw a salary for mom's demand. But Michael Bloomberg has a long history of feeding money from one shell group to the next that eventually filters in the pockets of his executives. Check the show notes for details. I thought I've got to get involved. And I looked online for a couple hours because I thought there's got to be a Mothers Against Drunk Driving for gun safety. Right. Mm -hmm. There wasn't. I couldn't find anything. So I started a Facebook page. And really, it was like lightning in a bottle. Did she look for a Mothers Against Drunk Driving for guns? Or did she propose creating one for Michael Bloomberg? Either way, the lightning in a bottle stems more from heavy corporate marketing and a corporate billionaire sugar daddy than real grassroots support. I have a bunch more from this interview that I'll save for next week as we hear even more of Shannon Watts' bad faith arguments. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Plug of the week, the Law Dog Files. Aaron, if you had to pick who was the funniest person ever to appear on gun blog variety cast radio aside from me who would that be well it would be hard to choose between ambulance driver and law dog i think law dog probably gets it just from his sheer variety of wtf stories so what would you say if i told you that Law Dog has finally gotten all of his stories, at least all of his American police officer stories, into one place in a book, and it's now available on Amazon for Kindle. What would you tell our listeners to do knowing that information? Well, I think they should go out and buy it immediately. In the show notes, there's a link for Law Dog Files. It's all of his police stories, including one of the stories that he told for us, and a whole lot more. Even if you read his blog, even if you read some of his stories, even if you've heard the stories here on the podcast, you need this book because there's like 50 of them. And some of them are way more insane. So most of them are funny. There's a couple that are just kind of, wow, that's wow. But they're freaking hilarious. Not only can you get the Law Dog Files, the American Officer Stories, you can get the next book. It's already available for pre-order. Law Dog Files, The African Adventures. Because as we know, Law Dog grew up in Africa, and some of those stories are crazy. If you're still not sure, you're on the fence. Maybe you joined the podcast recently and you haven't heard Law Dog at all. Check out episode 43, episode 56, and episode 63. Those are the three episodes where Law Dog told his stories. Episode 43 was Buster vs. the Chicken. And I played that for the wife, and she still laughs about that. Episode 56, Brigadier Captain Azakawi and Fido the Yard Frog. And episode 63, which is Squeaks. And Squeaks, if I remember correctly, was some kind of a small creature that they kept as a pet. I can't remember what it was. I think he described it as a tennis ball with a cone for a nose and a tail that was longer than the rest of him put together. Was it a mongoose? I don't think it was a mongoose. It was some kind of a... 
I think it was some kind of an animal that made a mongoose seem cuddly. <laughs> it was a little vicious, nasty creature. I don't remember, but Squeaks, episode 63. Check it out, episode 43, episode 56, and episode 63. And absolutely go to the show notes, order the Law Dog Files, and pre-order Law Dog Files African Adventures. You will not regret it. They're $5 each at Amazon. Absolutely worth the money. Go do it. It's worth it. Now, I am personally holding out for the audiobook version read by Law Dog because if you click on those links and listen to his segments, you realize that the man is a natural-born storyteller. Yes. And so hearing him read all of his stories in that unique voice he has just adds to the experience. Yes, it does. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that Gunblog Variety Cast Radio is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 153. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gunblog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. entire organization is made up almost all of volunteers i'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public i'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public here we go again (laughs) i'm (laughs) that's called a callback i'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public public fuck you god damn it (laughs) I'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public public relations. I'm not really familiar with the whole community organizer job description versus public relations and corporate communication and what skills might be common and and what skills and and what skills might be common for the big players of both of these worlds. This is a URS production.